Today, today I, we're doing the second lecture in a whole series devoted to a better understanding of the constitutional history of the American Revolution. Now, lots of people write different aspects of the American Revolution, so I want to tell you what, there are people that are interested in the loyalists, the women, the Africans, the you name it, South Carolinians only, or what have you. But the focus of these talks is going to be on the <coughs> constitutional changes, because I believe, along with Thomas Paine and many other observers of this period of time, that the big thing that happened was we changed from a world where everybody was ruled by monarchs to the beginnings of a world where republics were going to become more common. And this began with the American Revolution. So I'm focused really just on these constitutional changes. And I think they're amazing and they're enriching because if you want to know why Americans revolted, they tell you. Mm -hmm. If you know what was in their original form of government and you see what they changed, you know why they fought, don't you? Because of the difference, because they were able to develop their own government and go with that. Now, one of the things that I found in taking this approach was that you come to realize, or I did not start out with this supposition. I, I studied American history, like revolutionary history, maybe 50 years ago, and now I'm kind of relearning it. But when you take a fresh look at it, you come to realize there were actually like 14 different revolutions. It wasn't one American revolution. You'll see, I saw it, and you'll see this too, I think, that they'll produce very, very different things when they have a free hand in shaping their own government. So having said that prefatory thing, I just want to say that for today, I have three things in mind. We're going to review what we said about the southern colonies because I think when we talk about the New England colonies, when, when you look at that, you have a frame of reference because the things that New Englanders did were totally different. Well, I don't want to bias it, but they were different. You can make your own judgments here uh, from what the New Englanders did. They weren't necessarily better or worse, but they were fighting for different things, it appears. And then the middle colonies were a whole world unto themselves, as we will see in the next couple of lectures. So for now, I'm only asking to take a few minutes to remind you a little bit about royal government appointed by the king, the world governors, in the southern states. And those of you who are here, fall asleep if you wish, but um, maybe it's been a month, you might, like me, need a reminder. So, um, the style of government that they had in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina was that the king appointed the governor, the governor appointed his lieutenant governor, he appointed his counselors and advisors, and he appointed judges. And the only entity of local expression was the assembly, the legislature. And in this particular case, under royal government, in these colonies, which was not necessarily consistent, but in these colonies, they, um, the, the governor also had the right to veto any legislation that they might pass that he didn't like, and he did it. And also, if he thought the legislature was irritating, he could call, he could dissolve that legislature and call for new elections. So what we're talking about is a style of government where the governor, really the king, because he's operating through the governor, and there was no limited term. If the, if the king liked him, the guy would be there forever, even if everybody else hated him. Uh, Thomas Hutchinson kind of comes to mind. The king appointed him, they couldn't get rid of him. So it's an era, it's an era where the, this top authority went to the, to the royally appointed governor. And what we looked at, we looked at some changes. We looked at the fact that um, the governors in these states annoyed, to put it mildly, the assemblies therein. They were at loggerheads with one another to the point that as early as like June through September of 1775, 
way before the Declaration of Independence, they had already kicked their governors out. Their governors were not governing. They were hiding in warships. So there was a lot of bitterness there. They did not like their governors. They did not like them having so much power. And we see this when we sit down with their constitutions one at a time, which I've done, and you will notice patterns. I will just summarize here. But what they did is they took their legislature, when they had an opportunity to develop a new constitution, they gave all the power to the legislature. What I mean is, the legislature elected the governor. They elected the lieutenant governor, they elected, they selected the judges, and they suggested they elected all the advisors. So they overreact, well, let's, they reacted to the life they had been through, where they were starved for any kind of authority whatsoever by giving the legislature pretty much the same absolute authority that the, that the king's governor had experienced. So that was their experience. But um, I also added the point that the, the, the sides that change in the frame of government, they also took the opportunity to make some very fascinating changes to um, more creativity, you might say, in government. Virginia was one of these. Virginia established a constitution that had a bicameral legislature. That is, they created a upper house, like a Senate as we know, but they, we didn't have those before. They created an upper house that could be a check on the lower house. They also added something that everybody else did, and that was the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights was saying, okay, this legislature has all this power, but but we don't want it to be able to abuse people's individual rights, such as assembly, freedom of speech, right to trial by jury, all of this. All of these were enumerated, and they were done first in Virginia, so they kind of get the credit for that. But nearly all states did follow that example. But that's the kind of change they made. North Carolina made, even to me, even more interesting changes. They were the first state in the South to say, you know what? To vote in the South, you have to have 50 pounds worth of property, have to have a certain amount of land value. If you pay taxes, like you're an artisan, but you don't own that much land or that much property that values like that, you can't vote. So in North Carolina, they said, as long as you are paying taxes, even if you don't own 50 pounds, you will be able to vote in our legislature. Many other states will follow that example, but they were the first in the South to say, we're gonna let more people vote. So that's one huge innovation. And the other biggie is they disestablished their Anglican church. Remember this area was settled by British Anglicans. Um, the church was established, which meant, let me explain, when you establish a church, it means that if you were a Baptist in Virginia, you not only had to pay your pastor, and your, but you had to pay to support the Anglican church as well through what they call the tithe. So they had established churches, and that was the way everything worked at this point in time. And um, though that's, a, that's a major innovation in governing. So that's the South. Uh, did I bring a handout? I think I might have had a summary of some of that. Uh, let's see. No, I guess not. Let me see. Okay. But we'll come, we'll happen upon it anyway. So, um, so now let's turn to New England. And I use my fancy handy dandy thing, so we go through this. Slide? You can't either? Okay. Oh, you did it. Yes. Working with doors? There. 
Um, I'll just mention those of you that were here, I tried to explain that by having 14 different colonies that it may seem a little confusing. And so my solution to it is to think of this as an impressionist painting, that when you look up close to an impressionist painting, I'm thinking of Monet's, um, there's a lot of blotches and it's hard to see any kind of pattern. And for that style of painting, you have to like step back 30 or 40 feet and then you can see it. And indeed, you see your eyes mix colors that you didn't even see when you were up close. So I feel like that's an image of the American Revolution that helps show how these were integrated, even though they were quite diverse. And so this is a painting that I thought of. Okay, here's our findings so far, and that's what I just told you. Today's talk is gonna focus more on the New England states, and then about a third of it on courting allies in Europe. So we're gonna spend a fair amount of time in New England, and I do believe you do have this handout. This first handout on the first page, understanding what happened in two of the New England states, and actually, I better put this picture up. Everybody know what New England looks like? So I'm from New England, so I could be assuming too much there. Here's John Adams. Well, this is the New England states, but the way they were configured at that time, Massachusetts had the largest population, 320,000, but it included Maine within its population totality, okay? So Massachusetts and Maine are kind of together here. Similarly, Vermont and New Hampshire are together. Their population together is about 135,000. We're gonna start though talking about these guys, Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, probably the only really important thing is to look at their style of government before and after the revolution. Now they were heavily involved in the revolution, but nonetheless, they made no changes. They made no changes to the constitution. They just said, we're gonna continue under our charter. And that might seem really counterintuitive until you realize that their charter empowered them to choose their own governor, to elect them. So the king didn't appoint them, they already elected them. Secondly, they elected all his advisors. They elected the local officials and the voters also elected the legislature. So they pretty much had a democratic nirvana, you might say. They elected everybody already. There really wasn't too much to, to do as far as making another change, or so they thought. So it makes it a little easy for us to talk about that because they made the changes so easy, so readily. Um, I do have a little citation here. Yeah, Connecticut, for example, their way of establishing the Constitution was very simple. They just declared that, quote, the government shall continue to be as established by the charter received from Charles II. Charles II is like 1660 to 1680. That's, that's a long time ago for them. They're happy with that charter because it gives them all of these rights, both states, both colonies, all they did, my way of thinking, they just scribbled out the king when they do a reference to him and just, um, they simply said, it will be consistent so far as it is consistent with the absolute independence of this state from the crown of Great Britain. So it was very simple for them. No new serious constitutions or at least no need for convention or ratification or anything of that nature. It's a much different story. Dan. Yes. So why were the charter for those two states so different from the other, from the others? Well, I mean, I'm not an authority in that period, but I do notice something. These charters that they have uh, were established very early in the 1660s. And Charles II was a steward, and he was a closet Catholic, you might say. And so he 
couldn't be an out Catholic because he would never have been allowed to keep the throne. So he was by and large pretty tolerant and by and large not willing to disturb these two colonies because they hadn't done anything outrageous. In Massachusetts, however, uh, they did re revise it so that the Massachusetts could not uh, control the king because they were probably getting a little antsy or causing some changes, but they are, they're all old con And I think the southern ones, I don't really understand why, but they were, for one thing, there were dissenters in New England, and they probably didn't want to stir up a ruckus there, and it seems as though the Anglicans in the south were quite content initially with what they had. So it was never, that, that however was the main form of government a king would appoint, um, the king would appoint the royal governor. These guys were lucky, <laughs> if you not thought. Uh, and even more important, they presented an ideal for others, as we will see. Um, I want to dwell a little on Connecticut, excuse me, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, because their changes were huge as far as constitutional importance. Let me just grab this. We'll talk just about New Hampshire for a moment. I've got my handy little slide deal here. Um, the thing that's interesting to me about New Hampshire is that their format of government at the outset, even though they were in New England, was exactly the same as those southern states. That is, the king appointed the governor, the governor then appointed all the advisors, all the judges, all the local officials, and only the voters only selected the legislature. So they had the same format of government as we saw in the South, but they're gonna change things pretty far, as we will see. Um, New Hampshire's response to the American Revolution was that they were basically part of the gang of New Englanders that were beating up on the British in Boston and driving them out. So they, they generally sent militia to Boston to do this. So they actually kicked their governor out really early. They kicked him out in June of 1775, their royal governor, which was just about the time the Southerners kicked theirs out. So they apparently chafed under this system and drove him out as quick as possible. We're talking about right after the Battle of Bunker Hill we're talking more than a year before the Declaration of Independence, we got at least four royal governors that don't dare to set foot in the colony they're supposed to govern. So the thing that happened is New Hampshire, because they didn't have a governor right away, they came up with a temporary form of government and they operated sort of under the charter, which is described there, except they replaced the governor with a committee of 10 people, so they wouldn't have one person. A committee of 10, which incidentally is what the Athenians did. I don't know where they got the idea, but they, they replaced their tyrant with a committee so that they couldn't have any one person have so much control. So that's what, that's what they did initially, but in the case of New Hampshire, they were absolutely determined that they would have a legitimate constitution and soon. So as early as 1763, right after the Declaration of Independence, they started getting serious about the whole process of how you create a new state under John Locke's theory of government, basically. And let me share with you, I just, there's some of these things that I just really love. Um, here we are, the Declaration of Independence has been declared. And there's a convention of all the towns in New Hampshire, and they elect a spokesperson. And he gives a speech. And he says, and unfortunately this is recorded, he writes, it is our humble opinion that after the Declaration of Independence took place, the colonies were absolutely in a state of nature. Can you imagine anybody saying something like they were in a state of nature? What does that mean? John Locke's theory of the state of nature, that before government, we are in a state of nature. There is no laws, and we need to convene to establish new laws. 
And to me, it's mind-boggling that maybe I'm just not being fair to New Hampshireans, but you wouldn't really expect most people to follow a theory like the state of nature to the point that he's giving the speech to all of New Hampshire town boards and they understand what he's saying. I just, I'm blown away by that myself. So he says, we're gonna go into a state of nature and once you're in a state of nature, there's no law and you gotta create your own, how do you go about doing it? Do you just have your provincial legislature put something through? Uh-uh. No, according to Rousseau, and they don't quote him, but it is Rousseau's theory of the state of nature, social contract, that what you have to do is you've got to have a separate convention for only one purpose. You can't say, we're going to have a constitution and also decide whether we're going to have bingo at the same time. No, it's got to be a constitutional convention where the only topic is developing your constitution. That wasn't necessarily the case elsewhere to be honest with you. And frankly, in New Hampshire, I don't want to give you the facts and forth of it, but some people thought that's a little too long, let's just go with this constitution and they voted it down. They would have nothing to do with it. In addition, they insisted that there be popular ratification once the constitutional convention came up with something that had to be agreed to by the people. This is a major change that people should be involved in ratifying the Constitution. And it turns out that it's to a large degree in New Hampshire and Massachusetts that the standards are developed for what you do when you're in the state of nature and you want to get out of it, you're going to have a Constitution and a form of government. There's a gentleman named uh, W.F. Dodd who did a study in 1908 of the early Constitutions, and he kind of summarizes the importance of this learning experience for Americans of the time that were in fact in what everybody then called a state of nature and were looking to establish a new social contract. Dodd says, during up to by 1783, Americans now had a clear understanding of what a constitutional provision was as compared to a legislative provision. Legislative provision being something that could be voted out next year. Are we gonna charge somebody $40 for their cows or whatever, or 50, and that can change back and forth. But the things that were not supposed to change were the things that went into the Constitution, like, like whether the governor could run again, how long his term could be, whether he would have the right to veto. These were constitutional provisions that everybody would follow. But it's also true, according to Dodd, they also developed the concept that if you're in the state of nature and you want to develop a constitution, that a constitutional convention was a far more appropriate venue, that's his way of putting it, to for forming a new constitution. And the other principle that emerged about how you do this is submitting your constitution to the vote and ratification of the people. This took the New Hampshire people quite a while, actually. They finally got something approved in 83. But what they got approved is maybe on this chart. No, not yet. I want you to take a look at this. I think you might have this in a handout. Uh-oh, I've done wrong direction here. Yeah. So kind of hold on to your seats for a minute and see what they did. They started off with a typical royal governor-like southern type of government where, and then they went in the last column to voters electing the governor, voters electing, they created a bicameral legislature, so voters are electing the state, the state senate, voters are electing the city uh, the council, the advisors to the governor, and the governor cannot veto or dissolve the legislature. All these things allowing voters to pick everything. Does that look familiar? Doesn't that look an awful lot like Rhode Island and Connecticut? And as we will see, Massachusetts will do the same thing. And why, why don't we just slide into them for a moment? I think we can. The Massachusetts 
Constitution. It's considered one of the great constitutions. It got a tremendous circulation in Europe. Um, and the author of it was John Adams, which contributed quite a bit to its fame. And I'm not gonna dwell. Basically, they followed the principles that I described in New Hampshire. And basically, they were probably following John Adams's. He was the person that came up with this doctrine of social contract and how you go about it. He was the advisor for all of this stuff. So he's a guy who's, who forced me to change my opinion about him. Among all our founding fathers, he seemed to me the most blah. <laughs> he, only, he didn't get reelected when he ran for president. And what I discovered when you look at this period of time, he's the star. This period of time, he's the guy that made everything happen. He was the top advisor. He was the leader of all the people that fought, favored independence. They all relied on John Adams. And to me, and then of course this constitution would certainly be part of the thinking of it. So let's just take a look here. In Massachusetts, um, as why can't I think of your first name? Oh. I'm sorry. I can't believe I can't, can't remember your first name. No, Melba. No. No. Okay, sorry. She's on my building. You should be able to. Oh, well. Um, they had a little bit of a hybrid system. So it wasn't the same, as I told you before, uh, as the southern model, if we want to call it that. In this case, the king appointed the governor, but the legislature appointed all his advisors. So that was like a major difference between the two, although they still hated the governors. Uh, the governor appointed the judges. Voters elected all their local officials, town boards and the like. That was not the practice in the South. And voters, of course, elected their legislature. So that's the style of government they had. And I, I don't think we need to go through this, but the point is that they had a tough time with their governors. They were under military, when you step back and look at it, you realize they were under military rule for almost three years, beginning in 68. And then after the intolerable acts, they were under military rule again. But in September of 1774, pretty early in the ball game, they took over the state and really New England by cornering the British Army and forcing them into Boston and afraid basically to go anywhere outside of Boston. So they had already in Massachusetts taken control of the state. And they adopted their old charter, similar to what Connecticut did and New Hampshire did. They just added that the governor will now be 30 people. So they were gonna make sure that there's no tyrant involved. And then in March of 1776, the British leave, and so now they feel free to begin working on their constitution. It does not get ratified until 1780. And by ratified, they had the people vote for it, and they did have a separate convention, and John Adams was kind of on their case on this. Um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about this. That last column, if you would take a look at it, Voters, this is after 1780, what kind of government did they have? They had the voters electing the governor, not the legislature selecting it, but the voters are electing it. They're, they have a bicameral legislature too, and the voters elect that. The governor appoints judges, voters elect the town leaders, well, they've always done that. They do an interesting wrinkle that might seem familiar to us. They, I think our founding fathers at this early stage were bewildered what really to do about the governor's power to veto and to dissolve the legislature, which they thought was excessive. So how did they give the governor some role without it being crippling? And so this is Massachusetts, I believe, is the first one to do this. They set it up so the governor still kept the power to veto, but the legislature, with a two-thirds vote, could override him. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's, this is the first time they did that. Um, I want to focus a little bit on John Adams for just a few things. One of the contributions 
when you read the Massachusetts Constitution, it's pretty impressive. But one of the things that people highlight about it is he had a preface. And you might, well, what do we need a preface for? Well, I think we need a preface for our current generation, to be honest with you. He actually, in the preface, explained what they were doing by adopting a constitution. And he explained it in pretty common language, and prefaces caught on, because he's, I'll just read this passage to you. The body politic, he writes, is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. A voluntary association, that's how we govern ourselves. It's a social compact, shows he read John Locke, by which the whole people covenant with each other and each citizen with the whole people. That all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good. So as an alternative to being moved by the king, we're going to covenant with one another and we're going to follow the laws that we covenant together to develop. That was the heart of what these constitutions were about and it seems like he put it pretty succinctly and clearly so that other generations could follow what they were doing. Because I think having been born so much later, I don't think I understood how we got where we are. So I hope that's helpful to you. But John Adams made one other remarkable contribution to constitution making, and, and that is separation of powers. Montesquieu, we talked about him some time ago, was a strong advocate, and Americans were as well, for separation of powers, balance of powers, that sort of thing. But they all gave lip service to the notion that the judiciary should be independent but they never really figured out a way to do that. They never figured out how to make sure that they were independent. And it's in the Massachusetts Con Constitution that you just make a fairly simple change. The governor appoints the governor. The governor appoints the judges, but they will be holding that position for life so long as they don't abuse it. That gives them the independence that they have. And John was particularly concerned that something like this happened because as a lawyer, he didn't want the king picking the judges to lose all his cases, right? He, and, and of course somebody probably wouldn't want his guy to be doing it either. So you needed some judicial independence in order for it to work. And it's Adams that came up with the method for doing it. So these are some of the reasons I'm so impressed with John Adams. And Ed? Yes. My limited, limited knowledge of your, your topic here uh, conflicts in one way. My understanding was that Adams was, his enemies thought he was a, a, a Anglophile and too, too willing to. He didn't like the French at all, yeah. Too willing to lean the, toward the British uh, in any. I would say that I haven't gotten to that point, but at this revolutionary time, he is certainly not pro-British. Um, but I will probably agree with you when I start researching that period of time that uh, certainly he was anti-he was anti-French, yeah. pro-Dutch, and I think you're probably right. They preferred. Now, what we're talking about his presidency, which is like 15 years, well, 20 years later than this. So I think the situation's changed, and, and that probably is a legitimate call, but I don't think for this period of time he was an Anglophile. He was pretty, he took, I mean, he advocated independence. He was the leader of all the independence people. So um, that's the way it was, and, and uh, I can, that's the way it was then. And I think that's why. I am more impressed with the John Adams of this period than I'm willing to say I was when he was president. You know, so yeah, that's true. And I would suggest you look at this period and you might be more favorably impressed with Adams. So at least for, for the short period. And thank you for bringing Adams up because I'm going to try an impression. Before we start talking about the um, 
Before we start talking about the importance of the diplomatic relationships that evolve, I would like to try this. My wife said, don't do it. But we'll see. Now I gotta find it. Maybe I will end up doing it. Ah, too bad. So the theme here is actually the quest for allies. And I'm kind of addressing early on, and I think I have to, the fact that many, many Americans would like to think we did it all by ourselves when we made ourselves independent. But if you independently go through the literature and you read the stuff, you're gonna realize it wasn't the case. And I have to break it to you gently that that was known from the get-go by most Americans that the only way they're gonna be successful is if they had help from foreigners. Um, here's, a, here's a talk, a passage, that John Adams was talking to his fellows in the Continental Congress. And there's a passage that kind of summarizes what I was just referring to. Now for this reading, you're gonna to have to imagine me as a paunchy, short, balding man with a cane. It turns out he liked to talk with a cane. Now he was a great orator, and he apparently he had this prop, and whenever it was appropriate, he'd, to make his point, I need a louder thing here. Well, Judy said it was too loud in our room, so maybe it'll work out. So here's the passage. I'm John Adams, okay? We shall be driven to the necessity now of declaring ourselves independent. And we ought now to be employed in a plan for confederating the colonies. We need to think about that. And treaties to be proposed to other powers. Gotta do it. Together with a declaration of independence. Foreign powers cannot be expected to acknowledge us if we don't acknowledge ourselves, right? And take our station amongst them as a sovereign power and an independent nation. So that's John. <laughs> Yay. So, it was fun to do. I told her I was going to have fun with it, so anyway. So I kind of try to imagine, you know, all these other speeches that he's given, he always used a cane. I had no idea. And, you know, you, you can have fun with a cane. You know, you can really make your points. It's a gavel. It, <laughs> it's a gavel, that's right. That's true. He was short, he needed a prop. Yes, well maybe that's it. Except he was, you know, acknowledged as like the best orator of all the people for independence. So, um, but you're right. I need a prop. He needs a prop. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I'm almost afraid of losing everything, but I don't really feel I need it that much, to be honest with you. Um, so I'm going to talk about three nations and that played an important role early on in our republic. Is this still working okay, the speaker? Okay. The first are the Dutch. The second, we're gonna talk about the opposition in England. And third, we're gonna talk about what was brewing in France, because they were all crucial in different ways. We already talked about the Dutch a little bit, I shared with you how the Dutch were the ones that for reasons we don't fully understand perhaps, were supplying guns and ammunition to the Americans. Now it wasn't the Dutch government that was doing this. It wasn't even like a city within it. There were Dutch merchants that had long, long relationships with American traders. Many of them Dutch, maybe not all of them Dutch, but they had these relationships and so they just added cannon and gunpowder to the list of things that they would send to America, and they got away with it. British hated it. 
They were able to hide it very well. We owe them a lot because until March of 1777, no other foreign country sent us a single cannon. We didn't make cannons. We didn't have the capability. We didn't have the, the power to make gunpowder either. We started developing a cannon making a capability, but at the outset, we didn't have it at all. And we, we talked about that before. Well, I find that we need to talk about the Dutch Republic because I think when we understand the Dutch Republic a little bit, we're gonna understand two things. We're gonna understand why the Dutch stepped forward to help us, and even more important, see, we're gonna start soon talking about the middle colonies. And their experience with the revolution was quite different than the other two that we've had. And I don't think it's easy to understand why it is the way it was without understanding the nature of the Dutch Republic. I'll just say this, I'll try to make it short, but it was an amazing phenomenon. They were a dependent state, one could say a colony, up until 1591. So they hadn't really been independent or a nation until that time. They were under the control of the Spanish. They were all Protestant. The Spanish were all Catholic. The Spanish were trying to make them Catholic. A lot of 40 years of war, finally they gave up and they recognized the Dutch Republic as an independent entity, a nation. So now they're a nation. They can do what they want to do. And the thing that was stunning about the Dutch experience was they just blossomed. They blossomed culturally, militarily. This was the Dutch golden age. They produced it Vermeer. Vermeer, you know, the girl with the gold earrings, all that stuff. I, I don't have time to go through it all, but just to give you the flavor, they produced that, they produced Van Eck, a lot of his work is very stunning, and Raphael, all in this period of time by the Dutch. Even more dramatically, you see the Dutch, because of their war with, with uh, Spain, they practiced tolerance. Beginning in 1551, they had a law that said everybody has to tolerate everybody else's religion, even Jews, even Muslims, worse, even Catholics. Even Catholics, they, would, they would insisted for toleration. And that tolerance led to some remarkable, Spinoza, for instance, probably couldn't have worked anywhere else. He was produced by this, these years, these golden years of the Dutch Republic. Um, Descartes, remember, I think, therefore I am, guess where he wrote all his stuff? In the Dutch Republic. It was the only safe place to write stuff that might kick people off or, you know, alienate. Yes? Uh, co quick console. Have you read The Island, The Middle of the World? Yeah. I, I like the book a lot. I think I... That explains the Dutch to me. Yeah, okay. I, a lot of my material probably came from that book. And actually, I want to talk a little bit more about the guy that translated all those records. But that, that's ahead of us, I think. But yeah, I recommend the book. It's really cool. But I'm trying to do this like in a thumbnail for you. So they practiced tolerance. They had a great cultural outburst. And they got rich. They, were, they had a good navy. And they just they got rich in trade. They had colonies everywhere. And then around 1605 or so, they decided, you know what? Maybe we need a colony in North America. So they sent Henry Hudson out in 1608, and he marked out a claim, just like everybody else is marking claims. He claimed the land from Rhode Island. You gotta sit down to appreciate this. Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, all the way up to Albany, you know that New York to Albany Riverway is like one of the wealthiest and most amazing in the world because you can go 200, 150 miles inland and you can't do that very many places. It, it was a gold mine, really. And then the Jerseys was part of their claim. Pennsylvania, Delaware, and the eastern half, the eastern half of Maryland. All that was part of the Dutch Empire and they made it stick. They had Dutch people all over the place. And they ran that with policies of toleration and religious toleration all the way to the year 1600 or so. 
And that's when the British, who had been too busy fighting one another, again over religion, suddenly came up with a peace plan, you might say, and a new people came in and they said, whoa, they're getting pretty far ahead of us and that's an awful lot of land and we're pretty close to it. We're not gonna, we're gonna, we got a bigger Navy, we're going in there, and they did. They took over the Dutch land and particularly the most notably, they, they conquered what was New Amsterdam and now New York and what's now Albany. They took both of those places and, and when the treaty came in 1667, the Dutch had to give up all of their empire, at least the North American one, to the British. Seems like a disaster, but because it had been a fairly peaceful battle, the Dutch hadn't really resisted very much, the British decided two things that have big impact for us. One is all the people, all the Dutch that had land, including all these wealthy Dutch people have thousands of acres, they're gonna recognize that. They're not gonna, you know, give it to Englanders or anything like that. They're gonna let the Dutch keep it. So you, we're gonna have a lot of Dutch in this region, aren't we? All throughout this, these middle colonies. And secondly, they insisted that there be religious tolerance in this whole region as well. Now, to make things even better and, and longer, the British king, before he got deposed, he gave the land to Quakers. So he sold it, really, to Quakers. And so Quakers are just as pro-religious tolerance as are the Dutch. So what that meant is in the, all of this middle colonies, there's going to be a spirit of religious tolerance. And without our understanding the Dutch, I think the constitutions of these middle colonies would be a total shock to you. So I wanted you to appreciate that the middle colonies were a very, very different place. So I think we're doing pretty good time on it. I think that's all we need to do with them. But I also wanted to talk about the British. I think we tend to realize, we tend not to realize how much help we got from the British opposition party during the American Revolution. As it turns out, and those of you that were with me in the first half, you remember there were things called Newcastle Whigs, and then Newcastle died, and a new party of similar-minded people became Rockingham Whigs. Well, these guys were still around. The Rockingham Whigs were still around, and they were pro-American. They did not advocate an aggressive policy against the Americans, they advocated American rights, basically. But with a new king, they were kicked out and the Tories were the ones that were calling the shots. Nonetheless, they represented somewhere between 100 and 200, depending on the vote, members of a 600 member parliament. So it's only a third. And you might be thinking, well, that's not much support. Now, there weren't Gallup polls in those days, but what we do know is that the Rockingham Whigs represented districts that were heavily populated. London, Newcastle, all of the Liverpool, all of the places that were highly populated and like maybe only had one MP for it. They had, it was totally unrepresentative of the people, really. And um, many of the kings, representatives in parliament, had what they called rotten boroughs. They had maybe 10 people in it or 20 or something like that and yet they had an MP for it, even though you know London had only one. So that was one of their big problems that they had. And what it means to us, I think, is that the Rockingham Whigs may well have represented a majority in England in terms of thought. We don't know, because Gallup polls didn't exist at that time, but it's gotta be, they gotta be stronger population-wise, because for one thing, a lot of the press was overwhelmingly uh, for the American side of this. Now, Rockingham Whigs play a pretty big role in all of this, and in fact, they will lead to a coup that will happen in England that I cover in the book that is meant to show you the ripple effect of the American Revolution. The American Revolution was extremely significant, but it wasn't like a light switch, that it was dark and all of a sudden, it's light, we all have our rights. To me, it's more like we turned a cog in a wheel, 
and that turned another cog. And we've been turning cogs ever since, but it's that first step, that first cog, that is the American Revolution. More and more rights eventually came, but it came decades long, and they knew that it was not gonna change in a minute. They were living in a totally different world. So I do wanna say a few things about these Rockingham Whigs and, and other supporters of the American cause. Um, they were clearly important to the Americans themselves. And one of the joys of being a historian, I think, is you get to read some of these actual letters and you get to see how they fought in ways that you could only speculate about. So I, I'd like to just read this to you. You can see what you think. Thomas Johnson was, uh, he's technically considered a founding father. Anybody heard of him before? Thomas Johnson? Yeah. No. No. He's from Maryland, and he was one of the most influential and respected members of the independent faction. Of, he was a middle colony guy, an independent faction. So um, he was an early supporter of independence, but nonetheless, after the Battle of Bunker Hill, a lot of the moderates said, oh, this is getting out of control, we don't want war, we're gonna send this petition that we now call the Olive Branch Petition, in which we kind of threw ourselves at the knees of the king and said, please take us back, take us back, all we ask is you get rid of the intolerable acts. Now Johnson and most of the radicals said he ain't gonna do that. But there were a lot of moderates that thought he would. And so Samuel Chase is asking Johnson, why do you vote for this? You know better. And so he writes this. I'd almost like to read it twice. You find it in the Maryland archives. And he says, we ought, in my opinion, to conduct ourselves so as to unite America and divide Britain. That's how they were thinking, to divide Britain. This may most likely be affected by doing more rather than less in the peaceable line than would be required. For if our petition is rejected, will not our friends in England be still more exasperated against the court. That's a good line. Will our friends in England not be still more exasperated against the court? And, and will not our very moderate men on this side of the water be compelled to admit the necessity of meeting force with force? This was heavily influential in the thought of Americans that they wanted to keep that Rockingham faction in mind and supporting them. And it worked because by 75 and 76, some new leaders had driven to the Rockingham group, some very excellent orators. The three of the leaders were John Wilkes. We talked about him before. He was a freedom of speech guy, freedom of the press. He was like a lightning rod. He annoyed the king at every text that he could, but he now was advocating changes in government. He was advocating, advocating getting rid of all these rotten boroughs where people were sent an MP there, but there were you know 10 people electing them. And so he wanted to get rid of those, wanted to make them more representative of people. On top of him was a very interesting advocate for America, probably one of its best spokespersons. And his name was Edmund Burke. He was a conservative. He probably didn't advocate any of these reforms, uh, electoral reforms, but what he did worry about was he believed that England was involved in imperial overreach. That is, they were trying to control things too far away. I mean, it took two months to get information back and forth and that they just couldn't be successful if they tried to manage such a big country from so far away and with so many logistic problems. So he made that argument that this is a stupid thing to do that you're gonna lose. And I'm going to, and then I'll mention one other guy, Charles James Fox, another one of those great orators. He was not an intellectual at all. He was more like a street fighter, um, but he disliked the king and was looking for every opportunity to you know, 
give them a the nudge. <laughs> so here's just a couple of quotes that I think give you an idea of the kind of folks they were. Um, Burke, it's only a couple sentences. Burke was giving a speech, and he had <coughs> gems like this in all of his speeches. He says, your scheme, meaning fighting the Americans, your scheme yields no revenue. It yields nothing but discontent, disorder, disobedience. And such is the state of America that after wading up to your eyes in blood, you could just end up finding yourself where you were. They give them a lot to think about, don't you think? And then Fox had a more fun approach to it. I had no idea that he did this sort of thing, but he had a little coterie of followers, maybe six to 10 members of parliament. They all dressed up in Washington's continental blue and buff uniforms, and they went about their business in the halls of parliament, dressed up in costume like they were part of the American Revolution. Imagine how difficult that would be for the king to know that their kingdom is badly divided as you try to wage war. And I'll only add one more consideration to it. It would turn out that several of the key generals and admirals were Rockingham Whigs and supported the American cause and were left in an ambivalent situation because, well, it, it made it very difficult for them and that would make it helpful for the Americans. I have to say, the last one I want to talk about is Beaumarchais, um, France. And it turns out for this period of time, to understand what the French were going to do about the American Revolution, you only need to know about Beaumarchais. Now you'll notice that no government is supporting the Americans at this point in time. Dutch merchants are supporting. The loyal opposition in England is supporting. But all we need to follow is Beaumarchais. His name, full name, was Pierre Augustin Caron de Beaumarchais. And he was one of the most charming people that I've met. And I think I've said this before, there are three or four of these characters I would love to sit down with over a bottle of wine, and Beaumarchais is certainly one of them. He was already famous in June of 1775 when he heard inklings of what was going on with the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Remember, it takes like two months for the news to get there. And he was actually ensconced in the pay of the French king. He was ensconced in England collecting data on ship movements all that other kind of stuff you'd expect a spy to do. And in addition, he had the task of trying to persuade a French spy, who was a French spy, to an across dresser to persuade that if she came back, or he or she, I don't really know, I couldn't tell which, but when they came back, she should come as a woman because the penalty would be less. And that was the kind of task that you get if you're working for the king, apparently. But he was also engaged in the serious part, and he saw an opportunity when he heard about Lexington and Concord. He started firing off memos. Well, they didn't really have memos in those days, but you get the idea. So he's barraging his boss, the top foreign minister named Virginet, with, this is a great opportunity. Now, Beaumarchais is a complex person. Like every other Frenchman, he wants to avenge themselves against the British, who humiliated them in the last war. Of course he wants to do that. But it turns out Beaumarchais actually was also a closet Republican. That is, he wanted the French government not to be a monarchy anymore, but he wanted it to be a republic. And so he was so thrilled to hear that there could be a republic here. So he was the first person that we know of that actively made the case for French intervention. But Virginais was cautious. The French treasury was empty. They had got badly beaten by the British. They didn't think this was a good time to take on the British. Nonetheless, he also sent a, another secret agent named Bon Boulier. You don't have to know any of these names, but he showed up in Philadelphia at the Continental Congress 
and we know that he met with John Jay and Benjamin Franklin, who was probably the most knowledgeable person of, you know, about Europe or anything. And we do know also that he wanted to know two things. Would the Americans, were they really gonna go for independence or was this, you know, smoke? And that's what Don Laurier was supposed to examine. And also, what kind of help should we provide if they need it? Well, things were kind of quiet for a while. We don't really have too many records. And suddenly, we get a record. Okay, I can see it. I kind of wonder if it's fine. Can you hear my eye? Is that <laughs> can you hear my eye flap? Um, so, back to my buddy. So, it turns out, sometime in this interim, after November, he came up with a scheme that would enable the French to get involved without it blowing back on them. And I want to tell you a little bit more about, oops, I guess I shouldn't have moved it, a little more about Beaumarchais. He was not a noble, okay? And when I told you he was the most famous person, one of the most famous persons in Europe, he had just completed writing the play, Barbara of Seville. And in doing so, now Mozart will make it into a musical, but the play itself was a smash hit, Rossini. and after, hmm? Rossini. Rossini, thank you. I find Barbara Seville, Rossini. Was Marriage of Figaro Mozart? I'm not sure of that. Oh, thank you. Okay, I didn't know that. Very good. Rossini did it. Um, at any rate, he was already famous just on the basis of the play, particularly because he created a character named Figaro. Figaro was like a scheming trickster, a lovable guy, um, coming up with ideas all the time, each one wackier than the next. So he's very, very popular. Yeah. So if we just want to go back a little bit, I want to tell you something about the early development. The early development of um, Beaumarchais. He was born the son of a watchmaker, so he's a commoner. He was not a nobleman. And he came on the scene with a big crash when he was 21 years old. He invented a small device that you put in your watch, and it enables a watch to be smaller and to keep more accurate time. Well, the king of France, he loved stuff like this, and so he invited him in, and Beaumarchais was a mocker from day one because he took this as an opportunity to give a ring to Madame Pompadour, the most famous woman in the, in the French court. So he gave the ring to her, and he became a court favorite almost instantly. It turned out he could play musical instruments, and the king liked him, and so the king gave him a job teaching his daughters how to operate the harp. And so even though he's this commoner, He's now like a regular at the French court, and he's a very charming person. Um, I was looking for quotes about him to kind of give you a physical description. Um, he was barrel chested, and I do have a picture here. It's going to be. See, I'm not too good at keeping track here. So this is Charles James Fox, and here's Paul Marchais. Watchmaker, playwright, music teacher, secret agent, arms dealer. He did all that stuff in his life. But at, at the start here, the watchmaker part. So he was at the French court all the time, and he married this wealthy woman. And everything was fine, but she died. And he's a terrible money manager. He would, this would be a problem for him all the time. But he's one of those guys that's always coming up with grand ideas. One of them was to write a play, but most of the other ones did not work out. But this one made him, made him famous. So he was sort of an anomaly, uh, quite, a, quite a life story to end up being a trusted spy by the king. So the only other thing that we need to add to this is he came up with a scheme, as I told you, and he ran it by Virginet, as you would run it by your boss, and Virginet didn't say anything much, but he took it to the king anyway. And here we are in March of 1776, so the 
King's already had this information from Philadelphia, and he's getting this steady stream of information from Beaumarchais. And the biographer for Beaumarchais, Mr. Bonner, says, Lewis and his foreign minister stared at one another after Virginet presented this all to him, okay, and said, this is the idea. And then Lewis and his foreign minister just stared at one another for several minutes. Then they burst into peals of laughter at Beaumarchais' preposterously cunning scheme. It was pure Figaro, and they loved it. King loved it so much that he not only approved it, but he authorized Virginet to take the idea as an investment possibility to his cousin, who was the king of Spain. And so the king of Spain matched them dollar for dollar on this project, and so they approved it. Here we are. They're approving sending money, and well, they're approving sending guns to the Americans and ammunition secretly, and he offers to be the guy who will collect all the gunpowder without being noticed somehow, and all the guns, put them on the boat so that there'd be no blowback whatsoever, and he did that. It turns out that he was able to get the ships loaded in December of 1776, and they landed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1777 in March. And the story of these guns is decisive in American history because these guns were shipped from there all the way across toward Albany, and they were just in time to help intercept General John Burgoyne, who was coming down from Canada, you might remember, heading toward Albany, and was stopped at Sarasota, Saratoga, and decisively defeated, his whole army surrounded, and the end result was Burgoyne had to surrender, and shortly thereafter the French entered the war. This is the story of Beaumarchais. Hope you enjoyed it. I will, I think I'll only say that we'll be following this up. I don't really know when, whether we're going to do this next week or what, but I'm going to talk about the middle colonies next. I think I'm a little perplexed. I know that Christmas we probably won't be meeting, and I'm wondering, you know, what the policy is on November as well, but we might be meeting November 16th, find out, okay, and we'll have a talk then. So next we'll be turning to the middle colonies. Thank you very much.